My name is Eduardo. That's my full name written there. It's very long. Uh, it's a shame because usually it breaks website design, especially in conferences. But because .js doesn't put the talks on the website, I didn't get that. A bummer. I work as a freelance consultant doing front end, mostly Vue.js. And I'm also a member of the Vue.js core team. Uh, so that's pretty much my open source contributions. And if you want to follow what I do or some not that good memes, you can follow me on Twitter as Posva. And today, I want to talk to you about modern routing. But I don't want to talk about these little devices that gives you internet access and how the new models are starting to like drones and evil, even uh, Star Wars starships. That's another topic. The topic is front-end. Uh, so every time I refer to routing, I will be referring to modern front-end routing, although I always forget the, to name it. And I want you to give. I want to give you uh, a look at what we do behind a router um, and some deep dive into very specific technical topics. Not everything. I won't have the time for that. But I want you to get more interested into it and have some fun as well with the browsers and inconsistencies out there. So we will see how we go from this URL to communicate with a history module, how this history module communicates with a router, and how the router is going to communicate with what we call a matcher and also some components, which you probably are aware of, to finally get to you, the developer. So we start off by talking about the core of the history module. That's the history API. So I know we are barely getting started. It's already confusing. Naming things is not easy. Um, so the main API we have here is what allows us to control the URL. We have these two functions with the exact same signature, push state and replace state. Uh, so the first argument is going to be the data, which is going to be reflected on the history of the state uh, right after. The title is a string, but it's ignore. So you know, like web components, we all know it's there, but we don't use it. Um, and then you have the URL. The URL is what you want to see on the, on the address bar. So how does it work? We're going to push things into a stack, entries. And we can pop them. And it's a, spe it's a special stack because we have the length. We can go in between. We can go back. We're going to see an example. Then we have an event, uh, pop state, that allows us to uh, know when the user is changing the history, the, the URL, by using the browser interface, which is something uh, quite special. And then we have these two uh, other variables that are going to change. So let's get, get an example. We go to movies.com, which doesn't exist, but whatever. We have the state that starts as null. Then we have the length of the stack of history is 1, because we only have the movies. We want to push one state. So we have the state. And the title doesn't exist, like what components. Or like, it doesn't, <laughs> they do exist. Uh, then we have the URL. So we push that. And we have the URL that changes. We have the object that appears as state. And we have the length of the stack that increments. We can push another one. It's going to change again. It's going to increment the size of the stack again. Now, what we can do is use the browser interface to go back. So if we press back, we're going to change the URL. We're going to change the state. But the number of entries on the stack is still the same. And you will see that the forward button will be available now because we can go back to where we were or forward, which we can do. And it will change the URL again go back to the state we were at, and keep the same number of elements. If we, in the middle of the stack, we, for example, do another navigation, that might change the number of entries, for example. So that's when it changes. But uh, so if we want to know how these work exactly, we need to understand a bit better the URL and how it works. So to do that, um, you can simply go to the URL specification, which is like 15,000 words. That's like 60-page book. And I know some could argue that you could read a summary on Medium, uh, and it will take you more time because you have all these paywalls. But uh, we don't need to care about everything in the URL, right? Because we're doing front end. So the only thing we need to know about is that section after the domain. Because at the same time, we cannot even change the domain. That would be like the phishing dream. It's already easy to fish people. Imagine if we could change the domain. Crazy. So we have these three sections. We have the path the query, which is also known as search sometimes. And then we have uh, the hash, which is referred as fragment in the specification. So uh, in these three sections, uh, we can access them through a, a global object called location. We have location 
path name to access the path, location.search to actually the query, and location.hash to access the hash. And you can access the whole thing concatenated into one single string as location.href. Now, the reason we have this is because sometimes browsers and older versions are going to have some inconsistencies of uh, what is encoded and not, more about it in the future. But what I want to talk about is how do we get from this string oops, into an object? That want to be too fast, sorry. Can I go back? How do we go uh, from the string into an object that we can use, and more specifically, the query? How do we transform the query into an object that we can manipulate? Because the path is going to be a string, the hash is going to be a string. That's fine. But what about the query? So we have this API, URL search API. Sorry, URL. We have this API, URL search params API, which is supported in every browser. Like it has a very good. Oh, oh! Don't be shy. Come, come in. Look at that. Do you have something to say? Oh, you don't. You don't support it. I don't. Okay. Well, what can you expect from a compatibility solution? I guess. I. Ooh, whoa, whoa. Come, come down. Okay. Yeah, I know you're only 24 years old. No, I didn't say compatibility solution. I say complete solution. Yes, that's what I said. Wow! Okay. So uh, moving on. So we cannot use it. Wait. Oh, there is another one. Safari. What, so what, what, is your, what is your problem? You have a bug. So what is the bug? Oh, you don't encode it properly. You have things not working? Well, well thanks you for, for letting us know. Well, so you know, this API, um, it's a standard. It has a specification. It works nicely, but it's not supported by every browser. And even when it's supported, you have browsers that don't do it properly. So it reminds me of another API. I don't know if many of you, maybe some of you know. Anybody want to get take the guess? Web components, right? Because it's there, it works, there is a polyfill on everything, but we're not going to use it. We're going to build it on. So that's what we do with URL search farms, which is <laughs> trash. Um, but there is something interesting that was said by Safari, or rather I said myself. It's encoding. Uh, encoding is something that most people don't know about, yet it can be a source of problems that are very difficult to debug. And the rules are not that complicated, but if you look into the specification, it gets quite overwhelming, to be fair. So encoding is just making sure that the characters that you put in the URL are valid. Now, the characters that are allowed in the URL are only ASCII characters. And even though some ASCII characters have to be encoded. So for example, if you want to put the quote character in the URL, which has the x value of 22, you have to encode it with the percentage. It's percentage 22. The lesser than sign is 3c, so that gives you percentage 3c. And then it gets more complicated, because when you're with non-ASCII characters, you have to deal with lower bounds and upper bounds of you TF8 and other things that I don't even know about. I don't even know if I want to look it into. But basically, uh, the Enye, for example, becomes C3B1. Sure. But the fact is that if you want to write an HTML, an HTML tag on the URL, you will have to encode it properly. So it will look like this. And this is not very usable, I mean, very readable by the user. So what are the rules? How do we know? What do we need to encode and what shouldn't be encoded? It's actually not that complicated. Every non-printable character, so from zero to unity separator, I think that's the US stands for, not the United States. Um, so it's the character right before the space, by the way. And also the last character on the ASCII table, which is the delete. All of them have to be encoded. Anything beyond also, because it's not ASCII. And then you also have the percentage character, which uh, is also used for encoding. So of course, you need to encode that if you want to use it. But there are other rules specific to every section of the URL. So for example, the hash is the simplest one, because it's at the end. Uh, you have to encode the space. That's what the small thing looks like. Uh, a quote, less, less than, bigger than, and the back tick. The path, you also need to encode all these characters. And on top of that, you also have the hash, the interrogation mark, and the curly, curly braces. Now, I don't know about the curly braces, but the hash and the interrogation mark is because you have the search after on the hash, so you need to encode them if you want to use them. And the query is very similar to hash, except that you replace the backtick with a hash. And of course, if you want to use the ampersand and the equal symbols inside the keys of the values, you need to encode them. OK, so let's, 
This looks simple, but let's look at an example of how browsers are dealing with this. So we're going to use the hash because it's the most buggy one, it's the buggiest one, so it's funnier. Um, and we can bash on, on, on browsers easily. And we're going to set the location that hash to uh, this hash that is completely nonsense, hash, space, double quote, lesser than, bigger than, backtick. Now, all these characters should be encoded. And we're going to read the value back from the location hash, see what happened. So we see that in Safari. Safari says, OK, here is your hash, unencoded. Now, we didn't encode it, so we're not doing it properly. But Safari is not going to protect us. It's going to set an invalid hash, so to say. But what is funnier is that if we look at the URL, like just what we can see, the space is encoded. So this doesn't make any sense at all, because it means that the users are going to see a percentage 20, and you, the developer, is going to see a space. So worst of both worlds. <laughs> then we go to Firefox, and Firefox is going to protect the developer. It's going to encode the value, so that's great. And on top of that, it's going to provide you a visible decoded version of the URL, which is great, best of both worlds. For your users, you have something that is readable. For the developers, something that is valid. Chrome is similar, but uh, it doesn't decode everything. I don't know why. And Internet Explorer doesn't care, doesn't do anything, just take the value, displays that, <laughs> whatever. So what happens if we encode the value, which is what we should do? Uh, if we encode the value using encode URI, which is a function that exists uh, in the browser and, and can be used for, for that, uh, Safari is going to just take the value, and it's going to display also the, unenco the, the unencoded value, which doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Uh, funny thing. If you copy the URL because it's un unencoded, you will get the version unencoded, like the copy. But if you copy the other one with a percentage 20, you will copy a normal space. O also very, very, very intuitive uh, interfaces. Firefox um, doesn't surprise me, but has the best of wo both worlds again. Uh, encoded version for the developer, unencoded version or decoded version for the user. So same thing for both. Chrome. Again, same thing with this different encoding. And Internet Explorer doesn't care, so just take the whole value there, and it goes. So if we summarize, we have Safari is um, like, what the hell are you doing, Safari? Don't know, not sure. Uh, maybe I didn't see any bug on, on WebKit reported about that. Maybe it's a feature, you know? Who knows? Uh, Firefox is perfect. Like, this is the perfect scenario. It protects the developer but it gives the best uh, visible solution for the, for the user. Chrome uh, is it's great. Uh, we're going to say it's bad. I don't know why it's not encoding, it's choosing not to encode some other characters, but it's still great. And oh no, old OS X version. Um, that was the phase with the, the tongue out saying, oh, I don't care. That's what Internet Explorer does. So these two are, are doing great. And it would be nice if the browser did that like that, but that's not the case. What do you take away from this? Um, you should encode your URL, even if, even if it looks bad, OK? Because you're going to see some problems that are difficult to debug, like having a percentage that is decoded, but it's not valid because the percentage has to be encoded, stuff like that. And the thing is, most routers handle these, or at least they give you the way to override these behaviors so you can make whatever you want. Why? Because encode URI and, and decode URI encode a bit too much, too many things, <laughs> more than you want. So you're going to lose some characters that you didn't want. And they're going to appear like percentage coded, so they don't look like anything on the URL for your users. And you should use encode decode for passing the hash while using encode URI component and decode URI component for the keys and the values of a query. Now, if we go back to the history, because everything here is happening in the history module. Uh, we know that we get this object here that is nice. We know that the history module has to communicate with the address bar, handle some encoding, and handle browser-specific bug inconsistencies. But how do we go from that URL to something that we can use a bit better, where we can extract parts of the URL, like the ID of the params and other things, the component that we want to render, and everything? So this is part of the job of the matcher. Now, the matcher does many other things. One of the main things that it does before doing the the transformation is transforming uh, a path into a regex or something that you can use to match a URL, a string. So for example, we have a whole home. It's going to become that, that's that regex. Then we have with a colon ID. Then we have with a custom regex. And these things can be handled by yourself. There are also some packages that do it very well, like path to regex. 
Um, and the thing is, the problem with this approach is depending on how the matcher does it, uh, they're going to then store the things somewhere. And whenever you want to check if a URL matches with a specific record, it's going to check in a specific order. So if we have this order, if we added the route in, in this order, we're going to check movies new. The first one is not going to match. It's going to go into the next one. It's going to see, oh, movies plus something. That, that's good for me. But at the end, this route also matches with the two other records. And the one we wanted is the last one, the movies new. So how do we handle this? How do we make the router not care about the order? We have to implement something called path ranking. So we will give a score to every record or route saying this is how much it's worth. And the more you're worth, the higher you appear on the list and the quicker you're checked. Now, the, the way this works, uh, it's a bit more complicated, of course, um, but the basics is that we have some heuristics. Uh, so for example, we're going to apply a score of 70 to this path because it's a static path. It's a static string. It doesn't change. Uh, this one has two static sections. So we have 70 plus 70. But if we go to something dynamic, we have 60 instead of 70. And if we have a custom regex, we go into a bonus of five points. Um, so we can full path. This is where we take the router. Uh, this is where the router takes this, gives it to the view component. So depending on the framework, it's going to be different, of course. You can imagine that. But there isn't that much. It's going to display that specific component. And it's also going to give you this to you, to the user, to the developer, sorry. And that's the big architecture of the router. Uh, I hope I, do, I didn't disgust you too much about the encoding and other stuff that are now that pretty. And it gives you a bit more of interest into looking uh, at the router, contributing to routers. Uh, and if you want to know more about the router, just come and say hi. I will be around. And thank you for your time. <laughs>